Okay, guys, good afternoon, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, sorry for apologize for what happened, but I cannot start the class if I have somebody here who may be a hacker. And I don't know exactly what this person could do. So, uh, so what we're going to do today is to uh, review uh, uh, all the concepts that we have learned so far um, since next week. Uh, we have the exam. Okay, so. Professor, I have a quick question. Okay. Would you say as long as we follow all the readings and all the lecture recordings, we should do quite well on this coming exam? Mm hmm Yeah, I just want to make sure if there's any surprises or any external material we should look at. Nope. You know okay. what I discussed in class uh, extensively, and that should be more than enough. All right, and uh, of course, reading the book and doing all the practice problems in the book. Yeah, knowing that, so the most important thing, guys, um, uh, I mean, the, the exam is, should be just to check that you, uh, that you guys know what I'm expecting you guys to know before you go to the next level, which is organic one. So the point right. here is not secrets or surprises or anything like that. It's just to make sure that you guys know that. Um, so the one thing that you guys have to be really good at, um, particularly, uh, for this class, and that should also be useful for. Uh, oh, okay, Jennifer, <laughs> you scared the hell out of me, but uh, uh, thank you for letting me know. Now I know that, that I'm, we didn't have a hacker here. So, oh, that would be a lame ass hacker. So, yeah, go ahead. So, what I was saying is that uh, you guys got to be really good at assessing uh, your level of knowledge. That's the thing that could be risky. So, students usually, particularly in organic chemistry one, uh, tend to uh, think that no, uh, that you guys know some concepts and you guys really do not, and uh, and that's the key here. So being very uh, honest to yourself and and having techniques to identify when you really are still lacking the understanding of of some concepts. So let's do some reviews here, and if you guys are prepared, um, the exam is going to be. I don't know how many questions. Uh, I think it's recording. I believe it's recording. So it is. Recording. Um, yeah, it is recording, and I don't know how, how many questions the exam is going to be during the exam time. Again, guys, you should not be worried about the exam format because as long as you know the concepts, you will be totally okay. So nothing, don't think about that. So those things that are not under your control are not going to be uh, productive for you to be thinking about. Just focus on knowing what you need to know, okay? So one of the things that we, uh, that we learned in the previous uh, class, so Ruth, you had a question. Go ahead. Uh, no, I am just going to ask to make sure. Um, do we going? Are we going to kind of do our drawings uh, for like skeletal structure and then post it, or or how is that? Just because I have had like kind of problems in the past while posting my my answers, so just just to make sure. And yeah, that's a good not... point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So. Uh, there may be a, co a question or two, I don't know right now, but there may be a couple of questions, could be three, I mean, but not a many, in which you might have to draw the, the, a molecule on a piece of paper and, uh, and then take a picture and then all of the picture on, on Blackboard, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a problem uploading the picture, uh, the second option is you can just email it to me. I don't want you guys to email questions unless it's strictly necessary. And I don't want people sending emails with answers, uh, you know, like six questions later. So questions are going to be coming one at a time, no, back, no backtracking is allowed. When you get a question, if the question implies that you have to upload the answer, do so. If you cannot upload the answer for any reason, you must email me right away, okay? If you email that answer half an hour later, I'm not going to take it, okay? That should be clear. You should never go to the next question until you email the question in case you have to. But let's try to avoid that. It should be totally okay, overloaded the answer. But if there is an issue, you can always email me, okay? Yeah. But right I mean, away after the question. Never half an hour later or three questions later or after the next question. And uh, all right, sounds good. And uh, just one more quick uh, comment. I've only been booted out of a... Uh my test once. So if we're booted, just email you and you'll let us restart it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, yeah, because that's only happened once, but I mean, ever since I've, you've I've, been doing a PTSD. I will, post, 
a couple of very, I mean, a few very simple instructions about things that you guys, and that's important too, guys, and, and I'm glad you also brought up that point. Uh, please read the instructions, okay? Very basic instructions of the things that you should not do when you take the online exam to avoid uh, to avoid any potential problems, okay? Will we join the meeting for the exam? So during the exam, um, uh, I'll, I might send you also uh, a Zoom link in case you have, have questions. Uh, we can talk through there or you can email me if you have a question. I'm gonna be obviously online. Yeah, I think the Zoom link would be good because then we can get an answer right away. Well, but that, that has pros and cons because it's a lot of people and then, you know, you get two, three, five questions at the same time. I can only take care of one person at a time. People get desperate things, so let's take it easy. And if you have questions, uh, if you don't have the, the Zoom link, you can just email me and I'll reply right away. Okay, that's not a big deal. Okay. Yes, sir. Just make sure, uh, so uh, the the format of exam is going to be like uh, on Blackboard or online here. Yes, on Blackboard. Okay. On Blackboard. So you go to uh, and once again you we, you will have all the instructions, but here on Blackboard you will find a tab here saying assignments and writing assignments. You will click there and you will find you will find the exam. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the exam uh, is going to start right on time at 4.15. Everybody must start at that time. Uh, if you don't, uh, you won't be, uh, obviously, you're going to be having less time than the rest of the people. Okay. The exam is going to be ending at, at most likely during class time, uh, 5.55. And then it's going to be automatically submitted. Okay. There is a way to access all the lectures recording. So you go uh, here on Blackboard, you just have to uh, go to, there is a, a small uh, <clears throat> link on the left, which is like, a, like a three lines, and you click there and then access recordings, and then you just put the time frame, and, um, and then you can access all the classes. They are all recorded, they are all here on Blackboard. There has to be, uh, there is a uh, <clears throat> lecture one, it's also recorded. You have to maybe adjust the time frame, okay? So on, on the right side, it might say, I only show you the, the last ones, but you it's better to give it like, one of the lectures from, I don't know, let's say to be safe, August 15 until now, and I will show everything. That's exactly. Um, do we, we mail the answers to the questions that we go to them or do we put them? Okay, so once again, no. Uh, let me repeat this not to to get people confused. Most questions you must answer them on Blackboard, okay? You will have essay, essay questions or multiple choices or whatever it is. If it is an essay question, you have a box to type the answer. And that question must be answered on Blackboard. The only emails that you might send to me if when you have a question in which you have to upload the answer, okay? And it's going to be very clear on the exam. Uh, then you have to take a picture, write the answer in a piece of paper, take a picture, and then upload the answer on Blackboard. On, on. So if you have a problem doing that, you send me an email right away with the answer. Right away. Once again, not three questions later, because then I will not take it. Okay? Right away, you send me the answer, and then you go to the next question. Okay, the important thing also, guys, is uh, use your time wisely. Um, there, there will be no backtracking, but you will have plenty of time. So I, I will also post in when I give you the exam instructions, which will be also in the same in the first page of the exam. Please read them thoroughly. Uh, if you have, let's say, uh, I'm just making up a number. Let's say you have 15 questions and you have 45 minutes. You know they have around three minutes per question. Okay, since there is no backtracking, if you are spending more than three minutes in the question, then you know for sure that you will have less time for another question. Don't do that, okay? Unless before the question, you solve it two or three of them very quickly. Okay, so keeping uh, track of the time is very important when you do these kind of exams. So that you don't fall in a situation in which you know most of the time is gone and you still have question through, okay? Because 
you don't want to be stuck in one question that might be worth five points and you know the rest of the exam. So even if that question is blank, you can still score 95. But if you stop in that, in that question forever, then obviously you're gonna uh, waste time and then you won't have time to answer many other questions for which you are already prepared. So that's the kind of things that you gotta think. So once again, Ruth, in the recording area, you must select the time frame. okay? On the right side, it's showing just the last recordings. Uh, ask the, the, the Blackboard to just show the recordings from mid-August mid to now, and it will show everything. Okay, guys, so time, time, uh, time is very important, guys. That's the most important thing. If you don't know a question, don't panic. It's not a big deal. It might be just a few points. That's it. Better to... Uh, move on than to spend like 15 minutes on a question that is going to basically prevent you from answering maybe four or five more, more questions, which you may know. Okay, so time managing is very important. And it's also a skill that you need for future exams. For those of you taking in CAT and all these kind of exams, you got you really gotta be good at this. So that's part of the training for that, okay? All right, guys, if there is any other question, you can type it on the chat, I'll be happy to answer. Again, no secrets about the exam, but I think, will you post the answer to the practice problems? Uh, no, I won't. Uh, you, if you have questions about the practice problems, uh, talk to me in office hours, and I'll be happy to clarify any questions you may have, okay? The point of the practice problems is to have you guys uh, working together, talking to one another, to one another, checking answers, talking to me. Uh, if you post the answer, it's gonna be, a lot of people are gonna be just looking at the answers, so that's not good. Okay, all right guys, so one of the first thing that we learned in this, <clears throat> in the very first lecture was uh, different concepts about the periodic uh, trends, for example, we talk about electronegativity, and how did we define electronegativity in the first place? And it would be nice if you guys just talk out of your words, not look in the notes or anything, okay? So power of attractions or for the electrons in the outermost shell, that's perfect. So that's the definition of an electro electronegativity, right? So the power of attraction for the electrons that are shared in a bond or the power of attractions for the electrons in the valence shell or for the electrons in the outermost shell is the same thing, right? So you can use your wording as long as it's correct, the definition, and that's the definition of electronegativity. And uh, we talk about how electronegativity changes in the same row of the periodic table from left to right. What happens with electronegativity from left to right? From left to right, it increases, well, diagonally it increases, not more so left to right. From left to right, it increases. Right? Yeah, diagonally more so. No, not diagonally. So from left to right on the same row of the periodic table, electronegativity increases, okay? What happens is, uh, why, guys, why does electronegativity increase in a period from left to right? Why is that? Anybody can type the answer in the chat. Because valence, valence, uh, the valence shell gets more filled. Uh, no. Anybody can uh, type the answer in the chat. Uh, why does electronegativity increase from left to right in the period of the periodic table? <clears throat> Anybody? 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 You can reason this, guys. So, so let's say if the, so, the definition is attraction for the electrons in the outermost shell for the valence electrons. Okay, so the, from left to right, what happens in the number of protons? The number of protons increases. That's good. And also, so here is the, the point: from left to right, guys. The, uh, every every atom in the same period has the same valence shell. Okay, that's that's a really important point. Every atom in the same period has the same valence shell. Remember that the number, the period number, give you the number of the valence shell for that those specific atoms, which basically tells you that um, the distance in between the electrons in the valence shell and and the nucleus is not really that different, right? However, from left to right, atomic number increases the number of protons increases so therefore the attraction for the electrons in the valence shell obviously will increase it will be higher because you have more protons okay 
So since every every atom in the same row has the same valence shell, then obviously increasing the number of protons increasing the power of attraction, uh, and that's why electronegativity increases from left to right. Obviously, atomic radius decreases because uh, since electronegativity is is bigger, then the atom shrinks a little bit. Okay. So that's the reason for electronegativity increasing from left to right. What happens from in the same group from bottom to top? To electronegativity. Decreases. From bottom to top increases. I'm sorry, from top, from from top, top to bottom. bottom. Decreases. I, my apologies. Decreases. So from bottom to top, remember guys, this is easy because you can tell how from bottom to top what happens to the valence shell. So valence shells increases too, right? So the valence shell, the valence shell is increasing for every atom from top to bottom, which simply makes the atoms bigger, which simply makes the electrons in the valence shell to be farther away from the nuclei. Therefore, obviously, electronegativity is going to decrease. Okay. <clears throat> so based on that, and these are you know basic concepts that are pretty important. Uh, what's the most electronegative atom of the periodic table? Chlorine. Chlorine is the most electronegative atoms of the periodic table, right? So remember, guys, that um, I gave you in class, um, there is um, <clears throat> electronegativity can be measured, right? If you look into several different uh, chemistry textbooks, you'll see that there are different electronegativity scales. It's not only one. In our organic textbook, you'll see uh, uh, <clears throat> the periodic table with electronegativity based on the Linus Pauli scale. In that scale, chlorine has an electronegativity of, of 4, 4.0. And we know that chlorine is the highest electronegative atom, so every other atom's electronegativity is going to be referred to this one, which is 4.0. So based on that, we talk about bonding, right? And we talk about different types of bondings that atoms could have, and then we classify the atoms into a bonding in between atoms could be ionic, or they could be covalent. So when do we have an ionic bond? Anybody can type it in the chat, please. When do we have an ionic bond? When we have a metal and no metal. Mm, not exactly. And that's, and that's correct, but that doesn't really uh, answer the question properly. Any other answer? When do we have an, an ionic bond? How do we, what's the definition of an ionic bond? Okay, so when we, a transfer of electrons. So we have an ionic bond when there is a transfer of electrons, and that transfer of electrons happens when the difference in electronegativity is larger than 1.9, okay? So it's important, guys, to listen to the questions or read read the questions properly in the, in the exams, not only in this one, but pretty much in every exam. Reading the questions properly is key. Right, so when do we have an ionic bond? An ionic bond is formed when there is a transfer of electrons, and there is a transfer of electrons from the atom which is less electronegative to the atom that is more electronegative. When does transferring of electron happens? When there is a difference in electronegativity which is larger than 1.9 in the Linus Pauli scale. Okay. When do we have a covalent bond? Correct. So we have a covalent bond when the electrons are shared, right? Perfect. So that's the case for 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 covalent bonds. Electrons are shared, and in that case, we have a difference in electronegativity which will be lower than 1.9 in general, right? Now, we classify in class covalent bonds um, in two types. So we said that um, covalent bonds could be divided in two groups, which are polar covalents and non-polar covalents. Talk about polar covalent bonds, and we talk about nonpolar covalent bonds, right? 
and uh, and the difference here, guys, is when do we have a so what does a polar covalent bond uh, means? It means that electrons are shared unequally. Electrons are unequally shared, and in non-polar covalent bond, electrons in the bond are equally shared. So those are the definitions, right? So when do so how do we identify when that's happening? So we said in class that whenever you have electronegativities in between, anybody knows in between what and what? So when do we have a nonpolar covalent bond? Nonpolar is when it's less than 0.4. It's less than 0.5, right? Yeah, less than 0.5. Uh huh. And we have a polar covalent bond when the difference in electronegativity is between 0.5. 1.9 right <clears throat> so once again the important thing for me here is that you guys not only know this but i don't want anybody memorizing this it has to make sense for you okay because this is the foundation of everything that is coming uh you know after this so memorizing doesn't really make any sense at all i want you guys to really understand what it means and, and make sense out of this information so you can really uh, understand later on what happened. Somebody has a, have a question. So Ruth has a question, go ahead. Yeah, just to make sure, um, Professor, I was looking on the internet for um, different elements, right? At their different uh, electronegativity. And it's mm -hmm. a little bit, a little bit different from the ones you posted on the, on the problem. Well, so there, so, there are different scales for electronegativity, yeah. okay? So, so I just wanted to make sure, for the example, let's say we have this kind of similar problem as we were doing on the atomic uh, pro practical problems. Uh, you are going to give us like the difference because I also hear that uh, different books have a kind of a little bit. It's just like 0. 0.1 difference, let's say. But I'll give you the number. So I'll give you the oh, number. Okay. I don't have to worry about that. Okay. Thank so you. That's not going to be a problem. Yeah. The important thing more than the numbers, guys, is that you really have to, uh, as I said just now, more than the numbers, what I really want is that this information must make sense for you. Why? Because you're going to need this later on, right? So the most important thing is that you need to understand that electrons uh, sharing means, uh, oh, sorry, sorry uh, means covalent bonds and transferring of electrons uh, is ionic bonds, right? When we have ionic bonds, the electron is transferred, then you create ions. Clearly, right? We have anions and cations. Uh, we, when you have covalent bonds, if the electrons are equally shared, you have a nonpolar covalent bond. And when we have a bond in which electrons are unequally shared, then you have a polar covalent bond. One example is an example of a polar covalent bond is a carbon oxygen bond. In that case, guys, and, and that's why this is so important. So you know that uh, the carbon oxygen bond is a polar covalent bond. And I'm just going to add three more bonds here so no one is confused. Um, so the carbon oxygen bond is a polar covalent bond. And what, and what I mean by that is that this bond is polarized, right? And this bond is polarized, meaning that uh, oxygen, obviously, is more electronegative than, than carbon. So when I'm talking about this bond being polarized, a polar covalent bond means that basically the electrons of that covalent bond would be closer to the oxygen atom. That's what it means by, by a polar covalent bond. And that, and, and that proximity of these electrons here of the covalent bond to the oxygen will create uh, a dipole. And that's the whole point of me going over this. Because as I said before too, you're gonna need this information a lot uh, in organic one. So because the electrons will be closer to the oxygen, that basically means that the oxygen will have a partial negative charge over itself. And that will leave the carbon to have a partial positive charge over it, right? So that difference in bond polarity is creating a dipole, is creating two atoms with one of them, which is electron deficient, and one of them is electron rich. And that's gonna dictate the reactivity of these two atoms. Uh, in organic molecules, and that's how you will predict how these molecules will react. That's why this is so important, okay? So 
<clears throat> once again, not, not only knowing the numbers, I want you to know exactly what, what it means and, and to know exactly what you can do with that information, what's, what exactly that information is telling you. So when I know that a, uh, a bond in between two atoms is, is covalent, I need to know if that bond is a polar covalent bond or non-polar covalent bond. A carbon hydrogen bond is non-polar covalent, meaning that the electrons are pretty much equally shared here. Because the electrons are equally shared means that none of these atom hydrogens or carbon will have any partial charge over it because the electrons are pretty much halfway through, right? When you have a carbon bond into a highly electronegative atom, that bond will be polar covalent bond, meaning that the electrons will be closer to the most electronegative atom. And because of that, the carbon will be left with a partial positive charge and the oxygen will have a partial negative charge, okay? So that's interpretation of this, and that's exactly what I want you to know about this. Okay, Ruth, go ahead. No, I didn't have any questions. Okay, all right. So this is what I'm expecting you guys to know. Once again, no memorizing, not just calculating and getting numbers, but in being able to interpret that data and know exactly what it means, okay? We obviously went over, which I'm not gonna go over today because you know this from genetic chemistry, from electronic distribution of atoms, So nothing really special about that. So you something you should know, and I'm expecting most people do know this from general chemistry. So that's not new, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go over that. And then we move into, um, I believe next thing we went over was Lewis structures. And the octet rules. Okay. <clears throat> so when we draw Lewis structures, what uh, what exactly do we have to do when we are asked to draw the Lewis structure of an atom or a molecule? Count by electrons. <clears throat> you guys can type the answer in the chat. Those of you that. Uh, don't want to speak up you can type it in the chat and it would be nice if you guys do it because I want to know uh, what's happening on the other side once again teaching online is something that is kind of cold because when I'm, this the class that I'm teaching this same class that I'm teaching face to face is going really well I can see the response of my students but here it's quite impossible so once again uh, counting valence electron or in Lewis's structure you draw the long pairs, you will write. So, so you have to draw in Lewis structure, you have to draw the valence electrons. And how do we draw the valence electrons in Lewis structure? What do we use to, to draw them as dots, right? That's perfectly fine. So <clears throat> we use dots to show valence electrons. And then we also, that's the first definition. So if you have the Lewis, the, the Lewis structure, of let's say the atom of fluorine is very simple. Fluorine is in group seven, so obviously group seven will have seven electrons in the valence shell. So you need to add seven dots to atoms of fluorine. So that's really not uh, that difficult at all. Uh, but the next thing we did was to um, draw the Lewis structure now of organic molecules, right? And that got more complicated, um, but the, the same principle applies. And uh, so we're gonna go over that right now quickly. So before we learn to draw the Lewis structure, the first thing that we uh, learned actually was to draw organic molecules. Okay, so that's a really big, big thing. I'm expecting everybody to be really good at it. Um, let me give you some examples now. <clears throat> so the first thing first, I want you guys to be familiar with the nomenclature. So meaning that how do we call uh, this drawing? So what's what what's the name of this way of drawing this molecule? How do we call this? So that's key. It's the line and angle notation. Beautiful. And guys, that's important because if you don't know this, uh, let's say you get a question, draw the line and draw this molecule in line and angle notation. If you don't know what that is, then you cannot obviously answer the question. And again, you don't have to memorize anything. It's line and angle. 
because obviously you use a line to draw bonds in between carbons and then an angle because you're using a zigzag um, for drawing the lines and every every interception of these lines will be a carbon atom and obviously the end will be carbon atoms too. okay we went over this okay so that's the line and angle notation and uh, let's say i'm going to just draw something else here okay So uh, we went over the line and angle notation, and another thing that I showed you was uh, the molecular formula. So some practice problems. I want you guys to tell me the molecular formula of this compound that I just show here on the screen. What's the molecular formula of that? So I just submitted a polling right now. Paul, so please answer the question. How many carbons do we have in our molecule? Everybody must please uh, participate. So how many carbon atoms do we have in our molecule? Okay, so glad to see that most people, everybody actually almost pretty much got it correctly. We have 11 carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, okay? Good. So how many hydrogens we have in the molecules? How many hydrogens in the molecule, this molecule here? Okay, here is another polling for you guys. So please answer the question, how many hydrogens do we have in that molecule? So 27 people haven't answered. So those 27 people really should participate in the polling. Good, so we have uh, 16 hydrogens, that is correct. So we have three here, four, three on here is seven, nine, 11, none here, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So the molecular formula would be C11, H16, so this is something that I'm expecting you guys to do. So to uh, draw molecules in line and angle notation, and also to see a, a, a draw in line and angle notation, and then being able to determine how many carbons and hydrogens we have in that specific molecule. Okay. Let me give you another example here, right away, quickly.
Okay, so let's do the molecular formula of this compound there. Let's see how many carbons do we have in that molecule. So please answer the question if you have time. So come on, everybody please answer the question. 35 more people need to answer. Uh, how many carbons do we have in that molecule? No response from 19 people, please. Okay. <clears throat> right, it seems like uh, we have a few people who made a mistake here and I, uh, and I did this on purpose. Still, I mean, for those of you who are uh, in the class and not responding to the, the pool, that's no good and, uh, and I'll check later because that might mean that you guys are not even paying attention. So, uh, so we have here one carbon, two carbons, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So eleven carbons is the answer. Okay. So let's see how many hydrogens do we have there. See, <clears throat> let's answer the question, how many hydrogens we have in that molecule? So more diverse answers here on this polling. Uh, even though the vast majority of people think that uh, there are 10 hydrogen, so let's quickly look into this. So if one hydrogen here, guys, remember, two here is three, four, five, six, seven, 10 hydrogen. So the answer is 10. Uh, so the molecule has 10 hydrogens, okay, and one oxygen, okay? So that's uh, the molecular formula of that compound. Um, and then I'm gonna just, so that's the molecular formula. So I'm gonna draw another structure here. And then now instead of that, what we are going to do with this structure, <clears throat> So I'm gonna draw this structure and I want to you guys to write the condensed structure for this compound.
which is given in line angle notation, okay? So you can type the answer uh, on the chat. Um, once again, so I'm gonna write here condensed structure. You guys should type it on the chat. I want to see some answers and see if you guys know how to do this. So anybody can type up the, the condensed structure of the alkyl compound? No. So Adrian, that's the molecular formula, okay? Guys, right? that's the molecular formula, okay? Yeah, just um, the, the, the condensed structure is uh, writing like, um, let's say, um, piece by piece, right? There you go. So there is an answer, so CH32, uh, CH2, CH2, uh, closed, closed, uh, almost right. Um, so here, so we have CH32, that is perfect. I type it actually on the, on the screen. Okay, so, so that's Tamid had a, a better answer, CH32, CH, 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 CH2. So that's the right answer to me. So thank you for that. Uh, just one thing about the previous answer, guys, when you have a double bond, you usually don't write CH2, CH2, CH2 as the job row there. So you usually write CH, CH, okay? So the answer would be write that. So it would be CH32, CH. So I'm gonna put uh, subscript here. Okay, so CH32, CH, and then next I have a CH, CH as well. And then next I have a CH2, and then I have a CO2, CH3. Okay, so that's the condensed structure, guys. I wanted to uh, go over this because. Um, you must be familiar once again with the nomenclature, which means that you need to know the names of these uh, formulations so you can actually answer the question, otherwise it would be impossible for you. So molecular formula is given all the atoms that actually form that specific molecule, that's a molecular formula. Condensed structure is a type of a structure, okay? So how do you know when to use parentheses? I wasn't too sure about how to write the double bond position between the carbon uh, three and four. So usually, uh, Tamid, you use parentheses for the groups that are bonded to the main chain. Okay, that's when you usually use parentheses. Sometimes if you have a, a, a change of CH2 uh, in the main chain, you can use parentheses as well. Okay, that's pretty much the only case. When you have a double bond, just write CHCH. It's, it's better to do it like that, okay? Did that answer the question? Why is no parentheses for the double bond? Because uh, it's a carbonyl functional group, okay? So it's not a group attached to, but a functional group, and in this case, this is the, the carboxyl functional group, which is written as CO2, CH3, okay? It's an ester. So functional groups are reading slightly different as 
regular groups that are attached to the main carbon chain. Any other questions in regards to condensed structures? Okay, guys, so can we write it as CH32? Uh, I, I don't want, Galina, I don't want you to learn it like this. I want you to write it as I was giving it here. I, I want you to learn it well, okay? That's not completely incorrect, but I want to, again, the point of this is for you guys to learn it when you go to organic more than the exam. Can we do one more condensed formula problem? Sure, okay. Let's write another. And by the way, do you need to worry in condensed problems? I'm not gonna uh, uh, add cyclic structures, okay? So don't worry about it. Okay, let's make a problem here. Okay, let's write this as a condensed structure. Uh, close. The only thing that you have there is that you don't need the O after the CO. The O does not uh, uh, does not need a parenthesis because once again this is a functional group. Okay. So the condensed structure here would be CH3. Then we have CH with an OH bonded to it. Next we have a CO CH2. CH2 and HC, especially three. three. Okay. Very nice. So that's the answer. So I want you guys to really get uh, good at this. So when you look into your, the organic textbook, uh, you can read through it. And no matter which molecules or how they present the molecule, you will know. Uh, the OH is in parentheses um, because uh, it's bonded to the carbon, even though it's, it's an OH, or it could be named as a functional group too. That's not a carbonyl. Carbonyls are always reading it as this. It's a conventional agreement, okay? So only thing that you do not use parentheses when you have a condensed formulas, when you have carbon in groups. Mm -hmm. Cannot think right now of anything else, okay? <clears throat> so CH3, CH with an OH bonded to it, uh, CO, CH2, O, CH2, NH, C, CH33. You can do it, you know, as you want to. I usually go writing one at a time, so as, as I just said right now. So I wrote CH3, then CH or H. It's like reading the molecule. You just have to read the molecule and go and write it, okay? All right, guys? So this is something I expect you guys to also know, how to write condensed structures from line and angle, and vice versa. 
from a line and angle, uh, draw a condensed, I'm sorry, from a condensed structure, draw a line and angle. That's also, is the same problem, but the reversed, right? So you're given this and you have to draw a line and angle. If you know to do this from here, the reverse should be pretty simple. Okay, so both ways should be, should be really good for you, uh, really good at drawing the molecules from whatever structure you're given. Line and angle to condense, condense into line and angle. Mm -hmm. No, because usually uh, you don't, so because it's, so you consider the OH as something that is bonded to the main carbon chain. The carbonyl is something uh, that is uh, always written with no parentheses, just the carbonyl function groups. Okay, it's a carbon oxygen double bond. Okay, so it's not, so this is, so the reason is for, the, for uh, I'm gonna repeat again, just in case it wasn't clear. The OH is bonded to the carbon. Even though this oxygen is obviously bonded through the carbon, it's bonded to, uh, with a double bond. So this is a complete functional group. And that's why people write it as CO2. Everybody knows that this is a carboxylate functional group. So whenever you see a C or a carbonyl, C double bond, double bond oxygen, do not put parentheses. Just write ZO. Uh, because I cannot do it because, uh, okay, so hmm. here is the thing, guys. I, I want to move on because there is a lot of other things that are really important, and I don't want to uh, uh, to um, run out of time. Okay, so we can do one at the very end of the of the class. But, uh, you know, it's really not that complicated. So you can find any molecules out there and then draw it in a condensed formula and do the same ex problem vice versa. It's pretty uh, straightforward, okay? If we have more time at the very end, uh, we'll talk about that. All right, guys, so the next thing so we did was just to draw the Lewis structures on organic molecules. So once we have them drawing uh, in a line and angle, we work about uh, doing the Lewis structures. And once again, for the Lewis structure of organic molecules, the only thing is that we need to add valence and electrons, okay, using dots. So for the carbon atom, these carbon atoms, do I need to add any dots for any carbon atom in this structure? Do I need to add any dots to draw the Lewis structures? No dots, right? So how do I know that? So carbon is in group four, right? So it's expected to have four electrons in the valence shell. This carbon has four bonds, four bonds, four, val four valence electrons. Now that need to be added, okay? And that applies for every carbon atom here, right? So every carbon with four bonds will need no dots because they already have four valence electrons, which is what carbon is supposed to have, right? So what about these oxygens? How many valence electrons uh, am I showing in this oxygen here? How many valence electrons? One second, Ruth, let me finish here, please. So one, how many valence electrons I'm showing for this oxygen here in that picture? How many bonds on this oxygen, guy? Two bonds, right? If I have, we have two bonds, how many valence electrons? Two valence electrons. Oxygen is in group six. So how many valence electrons am I missing in that specific oxygen? Four, therefore we add two lone pairs, okay? Now that's the loose structure for that molecule because I added the, every valence electrons in every single atom of this molecule. That's the loose structure of that specific molecule. For this molecule here, the only thing that I see is two oxygens this oxygen, once again, I see two bonds, two electrons. It's in group six, so it's missing four. I need to add another four electrons, two lone pairs. How many bonds do I have in this oxygen here? Two bonds, two valence electrons. It's supposed to have six, so I'm going to add four. Once again, two lone pairs. Right here, how many bonds in this oxygen? Two bonds, same thing, four electrons are missing. What about, and the same thing applies to every oxygen here. Uh, what about these nitrines? How many bonds do you see in this nitrine here? 
three bonds in the nitrogen, nitrogen is in group five, suppose we have five electrons, so how many dots should we add here on this nitrogen to complete the Lewis structure? Two dots, a lone pair. So that's it, okay? So that's how we do Lewis structure of organic molecules. You just need to show all the valence electrons using dots. Every carbon with four bonds will need no dots because it already has four electrons in the valence shell. For atoms like oxygen or nitrogen, you will need to add dots as, uh, depending on how many bonds they are showing. Okay, for example, I'm gonna do another exercise of valence electrons. Um, this problem is just to, so I'm gonna show you here. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna give you this. And I'm going to show you the former charge. So if, if I'm giving you the former charges for every atom here, I haven't gotten into former charges yet, but you know, I, I assume you guys remember this. Uh, let's draw the Lewis structure for this molecule. So Lewis structure is adding dots, right? So uh, how many bonds we see in this oxygen here, guys? How many dots? How many bonds, sorry. How many bonds in this oxygen? Three bonds. Any other answer? How many bonds in this oxygen, guys? Three bonds, three bonds counts for three electrons. Oxygen is expected to have six, right? So in theory, it's missing three, but I see a plus one. What does a plus one mean? Is, uh, what do you can you infer out of this plus one former charge from this oxygen? It's, it's missing no one electron. Perfect. So if it's missing one electron, right, and it's in group six, it must have five electrons in the valence cell. If it has three bonds, how many dots should I add here? One lone pair is needed. That's beautiful. Very good. Okay. That's something that you guys should know, okay? So if I give you the former charge, you know that a plus one means that it's missing one electron. If oxygen is in group six, it's supposed to have six electrons in the valence shell. If it's missing one, it, it's expected to have five. Three bonds counts for three electrons, so it's missing two electrons to have five. That's all. What about this oxygen? So it's negatively charged, former charge minus one. Uh, how many electrons in the valence shell of this oxygen negatively charged? You just write a plus in between, Kobe, but don't need to worry. I just want you to write a uh, condensed formula uh, for now of neutral molecules, okay? So it's seven electrons here, right? So once again, um, oxygen is in group six, six electrons when it's neutral, is negatively charged, therefore has one extra electron, seven electrons in the valence shell. It's showing one bond, one bond accounts for one electron, it's supposed to have seven because it's negatively charged, so it's clearly missing six, so I need to add three lone pairs. Okay, what about this nitrogen? Nitrogen is in group five, Five electrons in the valence shell. A plus one means what? What does a plus one mean? It lost one electron, right? Perfect. So it's in group five. It's supposed to have five electrons. It lost uh, just one, so expected to have four. It has four bonds. That accounts for four electrons. So 
do I need to add any lone pairs on this in this nitrogen? No electrons needed. Okay, beautiful. So that's Lewis structure, guys. So it seems to be pretty. Uh, line and angle notation. Um, well, Veronica, that's a good question. If the questions uh, ask a strictly line and angle notation, you don't need to. Uh, but uh, it could be nice if you do. Uh, I'm not going to penalize you, but the point is that you should be used to write always the Lewis structures because that's what you're going to be doing in organic chemistry. Okay? We're always expected to know the Lewis structures. All right, guys, so that's pretty much about uh, Lewis structures. Uh, once again, very important to know the form, the, the number of electrons that you need to add. And in, that brings me very quickly to something that we just discussed right now, which is formal charges. Okay. And uh, formal charges, we also learned to calculate the formal charges of atoms. Uh, I'm going to give you just one example, guys, because we just went over that. Um, so one example should be more than enough, because I want to quickly move to the last section, which is slightly more challenging for you, even though it's the one that we learned uh, more recently. So. Okay, guys, let's calculate the formal charges here. Okay, so let's assume every bond is, is given. I'm going to show, oh, sorry, going to just say that this is hydrogen and hydrogen. Um, okay, so uh, what's the formal charge of this carbon here? What would be the formal charge of that carbon? That's zero. Okay. That carbon has four bonds. Four bonds, a carbon must be formal charge is zero. Okay. What's the formal charge of this oxygen here? Okay, so oxygen, and I'm gonna write it on here in the chat for those of you of you who might be a little behind. So oxygen is in group six. Therefore, it has six electrons in the valence shell, right? So that's clear. Oxygen has six electrons in the valence shell. That oxygen has three bonds, right? One, two, three. Three bonds will account for three electrons. That is a lone pair. Three plus two is five electrons. So the valence electrons for that oxygen equal five electrons for that specific oxygen. So it's lacking one electron. And therefore, the formal charge will be, sorry, the formal charge will be plus one, okay? 
So that's how you reach on this, okay? Oxygen, once again, is in group six, six electrons in the valence shell. Again, I look at how many electrons in the valence shell of this oxygen. Three bonds, three electrons, plus two, five. Five from six is lacking one electron, therefore, the former charge must be plus one. Okay? What about uh, this carbon here? What's the former charge of this carbon over here? Very good. So that carbon has, once again, carbon is in group four. So I could say carbon equals four electrons in the valence shell. Right? So carbon has four electrons in the valence shell. Um, that carbon has three bonds. One, two, three, three bonds. That accounts for three electrons, no lone pairs. So the total number of electrons, so valence electrons for that carbon. It's three electrons, so it's supposed to have four. It has three, so it's lacking one electron. Therefore, the former charge of the carbon will be, once again, positive one. Go ahead, Ruth. You had a question before. Sorry yeah, about that. If, if we have a question about this, and since we have a lot of carbons over here, are we going to be like, uh, it's going to be already like pointing out at what carbon we are referring to or or, or how it would be clear okay you need to worry about it yeah thank you either give the the former charge for every carbon atom or for carbon atoms label with like this or you know it could be it would, it would be pretty clear so don't worry about it okay what about uh this carbon here guys what's the former charge of this carbon here that's a carbon with four bonds Four, elect four bonds, four electrons. Carbon is in group four. Therefore, uh, the former charge is zero. Uh, what about this carbon here? The carbon has three bonds. That's three electrons plus a long pair. That's five electrons in the valence shell of the carbon. So the carbon has five electrons in the valence shell. It's supposed to have four. It has an extra electron, therefore, the former charge is negative one. Beautiful. What about this nitrogen here? So that nit nitrogen is in group five, five electrons in the valence shell, no lone pairs, four bonds, four electrons, so it's lacking one electron, therefore, the former charge would be plus one. Okay, so guys, that's how you simply uh, calculate former charges. You don't need to memorize formulas or anything like that. Okay, you just need to know the electrons in the valence shell of the atom, which obviously clear uh, equals the group number, and then count the electrons in the valence shell of the specific atom that you have been asked. Compare them. If it's lacking one electron, the charge will be plus one. If it has an extra electron, the charge will be minus one. All right. So really nothing uh, complicated here whatsoever. And let's move quickly to the last topic of the uh, for the exam, which is what we most recently learned. Uh, so slightly more challenging. I'm going to open a new uh, a new document here to have enough space because this is going to take me a lot, uh, lot of space. Okay, so now that we have learned to draw organic molecules, draw Lewis structures, we know the former charges, then the only thing now that is now the next thing we learned uh, was to um, okay, Adam, was to um, look into now the specific bonds in molecules. Okay, we classified bonds before into covalent and, and, uh, and ionic, covalent, polar, and nonpolar, and so forth. And the covalent bonds, so we classified this, these covalent bonds also as sigma and pi. If anybody remembers the definition of a sigma bond?
sigma bond. What's a sigma bond? Direct overlap of orbitals. That's beautiful. As a direct overlapping. Now we can talk better uh, because we know hybridization. So we can say direct overlapping of atomic or hybrid orbitals. Okay, that's the definition of a sigma bond, guys. Remember that. Very important. Uh, and I show you before uh, that means basically something like this. When you have a direct overlapping of two atomic or hybrid orbitals, that's the definition of a sigma bond. Okay? So what's the definition of a pi bond? Is the side by side overlapping? Beautiful of pure p orbitals. Properly aligned. Okay, which means same plane and parallel. Okay, so that's that's a that's a really good uh, thing that you guys remember. Uh, at least some of you. So definition of those once again in this specific case sigma bond is direct overlapping a pi bond side by side overlappings of p orbitals that are properly aligned and properly aligned meaning they are parallel and in the same plane so the result guys of a sigma bond and i'm going to draw it over here uh better i think uh, this may actually help you to see what that is the result of a sigma bond which is a side by side overlapping of i'm sorry the sigma bond which is direct overlapping of atomic or hybrid orbitals when two orbitals overlap direct this is a sigma bond the result of um, side by side overlapping is something like this you know now that is a cloud of electrons above and below the plane of the molecule okay so that's the definition of a sigma and pi bond. This is a pi bond and this is a sigma bond. Okay. So that's really important to begin with. Okay, that's the first thing that you need to know because now we we are going to look into bonding and also uh, into geometry of this bonding. Okay. All right. So I'm going to draw a molecule here uh very quickly and i'm gonna ask a few questions in regards to hybridization uh Okay, so I'm giving here the Lewis structure of this compound. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys a couple of questions. Okay, so question number one is gonna be, so what is the hybridization of this carbon atom? SP3. Okay, right, SP3. So, so remember guys, SP3 hybridization, meaning that, uh, when, uh, and this is how you are going guys to reason this sp3 hybridized because it has four sigma bonds so meaning that there are not pi bonds whatsoever so we tell we can assign sp3 hybridization because there are four single bonds all of them being sigma bonds so that's the definition of an sp3 hybridized atom okay so at the moment we say sp3 hybridization we can say that we are hybridizing 1s and 3p so guys remember we are talking about four sp3 hybrid orbitals okay so any atom which is sp3 hybridized is going to have um obviously four sigma bonds and obviously all four sigma bonds will be through sp3 hybridized orbitals which looks like this 
So Ruth, go ahead and ask the question why I draw this. Yeah, uh, so we have a nitrogen and uh, which let's say contain three bonds and one lone pair, then it will be still uh, SP3, right? Because we have only no, lone no, pairs. No, 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 we'll take it. No, 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 not at all. We're all going to do that later. Let's go one step at a time, okay? So if you have a nitrogen with, with a triple bond, uh, can it be SP3? No, it cannot, but what about if they are not like in the same row, let's say? No, okay, so that's so the, it cannot be sp3 because it has pi bonds. So the definition of an sp3 atom is an atom that has four sigma bonds. Okay, guys, that's super important. What's the geometry for an any sp3 hybridized atom? What's the geometry of that? 109 tetrahedral structure and the angle being 109.5. So the geometry is tetrahedral structure and the angle is 109.5 degrees, okay? So guys, I want you guys to picture this, okay? So whenever you look into an SP3, uh, an SP3 um, atom is an atom with four sigma bonds. If it SP3 hybridized, it will have four SP3 hybrid orbitals. Each one of them will be used for a sigma bond. Four sigma bonds, four sp3 hybrid orbitals, and it's a tetrahedral structure, which means that it will look basically like this. What I'm going to show here on the screen. Okay, so it's a tetrahedral structure. The angle in between each hybrid orbital here is 109.5. Okay, I'm gonna put it just in case you guys uh, have questions. So the angle here is gonna be in between each hybrid orbital is gonna be 109.5 degrees. Okay. So that's the definition of an sp3 hybrid orbital. So if I ask you guys quickly, uh, this CH bond here, what are the orbitals participating in this CH bond? So what are the orbitals participating in that specific CH bond? So, this sigma bond is form, is in between this hydrogen and this carbon. This carbon is sp3. So it's going to be using, as I just said, an sp3 hybrid orbital for every sigma bond. And the hydrogen does not hybridize because it's just having one s. So this is a sigma sp3 s. Okay, and I'm expecting you guys to know this, just to be very clear, okay? You must know uh, and be familiar with the orbitals participating in bonding. It's very important. Which ways is written? No, it doesn't matter. SP3, as, as long as you tell the right answer, uh, I'll, you know, I assume that you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so Ryan, this sigma bond is in between this carbon and this hydrogen. Okay, this carbon is sp3 hybridized, meaning that every sigma bond in this carbon will be from an sp3 hybrid orbital. It has four sp3 hybrid orbitals, four sigma bonds, each sigma bond with an sp3 hybrid orbital. Look at the picture here. So this sigma bond is with an sp3 hybrid orbital from the carbon and an s orbital from the hydrogen. So this is a sigma sp3 s. So the orbitals participating in the direct by direct overlapping here is, and I'm going to show you over here, is an sp3, sigma sp3, and the, the hydrogens using an s orbital. So this is direct overlapping of a hybrid sp3 orbital 
and an s orbital that's that's the definition of 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 this bonding okay what is the hybridization guys on this carbon here okay so this carbon how many sigma bonds do we have in this carbon three sigma bond and one pi bond right so this carbon has three sigma bonds and one pi bond okay total number so in the double bond one is sigma one pi but the total number of sigma bonds here is three sigma bonds and one pi bond okay so guys if there is one pi bond the atom will be sp2 hybridized why is that i explained this in class because remember there are four orbitals in the valent shell if there is one pi bond one p orbital must be safe for this pi bond look at the definition of pi bonds here if one p orbital is safe for the pi bond you have only three remaining one s and two p that's sp2 hybridization okay when we talk once again about sp2 hybridization i want you guys to think quickly picture that as how many sp2 hybrid orbitals should uh we have in any sp2 hybridized atom how many sp2 hybrid orbitals is this any sp2 hybrid atom it's going to have how many three sp2 hybrid orbitals beautiful okay any atom which is sp2 hybridized will have obviously it's one s and two p three sp2 hybrid orbital and it will have a pure p orbital for the pi bond okay so so guys these are once again what I, i'm showing you every atom here that we are working on is on the second period it has four orbitals in the valence shell and i'm showing here the four orbitals for every atom depending on the hybridization state this one is sp3 hybridized the four orbitals are four sp3 hybrid orbitals that's why we said this is an sp3s this is an sp2 hybrid orbitals the four orbitals surrounding this carbon will be three sp2 hybrid orbitals and one for the pi bond okay so the sigma bond here the sigma bond, i should color code this as red so so what about so in the double bond here first of all what are the atoms participating in the double bond i'm sorry the atoms that what are the orbitals participating in the double bond So I'm going to type it in the chat. Very important. What are the orbitals participating in the double bond? okay guys in the double bond here okay in the double bond one bond is pi so what are the orbitals participating in the pi bond guys what are the orbitals participating in a pi bond Two pure p orbitals, one from each carbon, right? So one p orbital from each this carbon, and one p orbital for this carbon. These two p orbitals, the side by side overlapping of these two p orbitals, will be responsible for the pi bond. So one bond is pi from two p orbitals, and the second bond is sigma. One bond is sigma, and in that case, that sigma bond is from an sp2 carbon and another sp2 carbon so that's a sigma sp2 sp2 so once again the question here was what are the bonds the orbitals participating in the double bond 
Okay, the dot bound has one bond which is pi and one bond which is sigma. The pi bond is obviously the result of side by side overlapping of pure pure orbitals properly aligned. So the orbitals participating in the pi bond must be two pure p orbitals. The sigma bond is the side direct overlapping of hybrid orbitals. In this case, this carbon is sp2, so it will be contributed with an sp2 hybrid orbital, and the second carbon is also sp2. It will also be contributing with an sp2 hybrid orbital, so this will be a sigma sp2 sp2. Okay. Okay, so what are the orbitals participating in this sigma one? Uh huh. So the orbitals participating, so this is sigma one, is this carbon is sp2 hybridized. So be forming all sigma, the three sigma bonds that it has with three sp2 hybrid orbitals, and this carbon is sp3 hybridized. So its four sigma bonds will be with sp3 hybrid orbitals. So this is a sigma sp2 sp3. Okay. All right. Exactly, I mean, because the two p orbitals are forming the pi bond in that double bond, and the two hybrid orbitals are the sigma bond. So that's exactly correct. Okay, guys. So, what is the hybridization of this oxygen here? What is the hybridization of that oxygen? So that oxygen has a double bond. Any atom with a double bond will be sp2 hybridized. Very few people are actually answering on the chat. I hope you guys are paying attention. Or if you're not understanding something, please speak up. Because once again, it's very hard to be teaching when you don't know what's happening with so many people that are not participating in the conversation. Okay, so that oxygen is sp2 hybridized because it has a double bond. Any atom with a double bond will be sp2 hybridized, and it's sp2 hybridized means that right away, the moment I assign sp2 hybridization, I need to understand that that oxygen is going to have three sp2 hybrid orbitals around it and one pure pure orbital remember guys once again we're talking about atoms in the second row of the periodic table every single one of them has four orbitals in the valence shell we're just figuring what are the four orbitals in the valence shell that are participating in the bonding for an sp2 atom like this one those four orbitals will be 3sp2 and 1p. 1p for the pi bond and the remaining 3sp2. One will be for the sigma. And then my question is in which, I'm going to type it on the shot, in which orbital are the lone pairs of that oxygen located? So let's color code this oxygen as blue. So for the blue oxygen, uh, the lone pairs will be located in which type of orbital? In sp2 hybrid orbitals. Beautiful. Why is that? Because this oxygen is sp2 hybridized. It has three sp2 hybrid orbitals. So one sp2 will be used for the sigma bond of the double bond. And the remaining two sp2 will be for the lone pairs. And then I'm going to ask another question now. What's the angle? between the lone pairs. What's the angle between the lone pair, guys? It could be as, uh, 
Exactly, right? So guys, one of the things that I want you guys, the moment you think about SP2 atoms, see how I drew the, the, I drew the, the SP3 here, four sigma SP3. So the moment you think about an SP2, you know that you have three SP2 hybrid orbitals, okay, which will look like this, and one P orbital, which would be perpendicular to these three, and the angle here is 120. Because they repel each other, it would be slightly higher than 120, but uh, if you say 120, it would be totally okay with that, okay? So that's very important. And then I also wanted, before we uh, finish today's class, uh, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be here a little, few more minutes we have this, this issue at the very beginning so what about that oxygen uh, what is the hybridization of that oxygen the red oxygen sp2. so the red oxygen will also be sp2 hybridized and the reason for that is once again guys because i explained in the previous class every atom with, with lone pairs next to an sp2 atom will be sp2 hybridized what is the hybridization of this carbon here what's the hybridization of that carbon any other answer what's the hybridization of this carbon here guys what's the hybridization of that carbon so that carbon is is correct that's sp3 hybridized Okay, don't forget that because there are no lone pairs, that's beautiful, okay? No lone pairs, therefore it's sp3 hybridized. The oxygen is sp2 because it does have lone pairs. Any atom with lone pairs next to an sp2 will be also sp2 hybridized. And then the moment is sp2 hybridized, I am quickly going to put in my mind this orbital picture that I have here, meaning that that specific oxygen has three sp2 hybrid orbitals which are going to look like this and one pure p orbital okay so my question now uh, and i want you guys to take a few seconds to answer the question for the red oxygen what's the angle between the lone pairs for the red oxygen So for the red oxygen, what's the angle between the lone pairs? Okay, so to answer this question, uh, I, I, I want, I'm gonna go one step at a time, okay? And answer the question over here. As I said, the moment I know this oxygen is sp2, I know the four orbitals around it will be three sp2 and one p. Is that correct? Yes, right? So now I'm going to just take this picture here, going to move it over here, and I'm going to assign each orbital for what is exactly going to be used. So I can answer my question one step at a time. Okay. Okay. How many sigma bonds do we have in this oxygen, guys? How many sigma bonds here? Two sigma bonds. There is a sigma bond here, and there is a sigma bond over here. So two sigma bonds. So therefore, we have for one sp2 will be used for one sigma bond. That's easy to assign. Since I have two sigma bonds, the second sp2 will be for another sigma bond, and then I have an sp2 and a p, which are free, and I have two lone pairs. So one lone pair is certainly gonna be located in, uh, in an sp2 hybrid orbital, and the second lone pair will be located in a pure p orbital. Okay. One thing, how did I know that? I know this oxygen is sp2 because it has lone pairs next to an sp2. The moment I know it's sp2, I know it has its four orbitals are three sp2 and one p. I know this because I know the hybridization, okay? Now that I know that, then I say, okay, 
one sp2 must be used for one sigma, one sp2 for the other sigma, one sp2 for a lone pair, and the second sp2 for the lone pair. Therefore, the angle in between the two lone pairs will be 90 degrees. Okay, somebody had a question. So does that mean the electrons sometimes become a double bond? Exactly, and that's what we're going to talk about. And when we talk about resonance, Kobe, we're going to discuss that. Okay, because this is the foundation to understand resonance later on. We will get deep into that later on. Okay. So for you guys to really get a good understanding later on, uh, and this is something you're going to use a lot in OrgoChem, it is imperative for me that you guys really understand well the orbitals used for bonding in any molecules in organic chemistry, and that will be in the exam. That will be a major part of the exam, because I really want you guys to, to, to know when you look at an organic molecule, identify the bondings, sigma, pi, covalent, uh, and uh, polar and polar covalent. And, once, and I want you guys to be able to assign hybridization. Because once you assign hybridization, it will be very easy for you to tell what are the, uh, the orbitals surrounding that specific atom. And the moment you tell that, you can talk about the geometry of the molecule, the angle in between bonds, the angle in between lone pairs. That will help you to understand reactions later on. I'm going to give you, before we finish today, another example very quickly. Um, I'm going to give you another example. So I'm going to draw the Lewis structure of this molecule. Now I should add two lone pairs here, one here, two here, and one here. Okay. And then quickly, I'm going to ask you now uh, what is the hybridization of this carbon? So that carbon has two pi bonds. Okay, so any atom with two pi bonds will be sp hybridized. Okay. Very important, sp hybridized. And when I think about an sp, I know it's a linear carbon, all right? It's a linear carbon, sp, so the sigma bond, the angle in between the sigma bond will be 180. That's sp hybridized. And once again, the point is here to think about the orbital surrounding every carbon or oxygen or any atom in organic molecules so we can think about the uh, geometry and bonding. So any atom that is sp hybridized, if it is sp hybridized, it means that it has two pi bonds. If it has two pi bonds, it actually means that it must have, or it must have, actually must be using two p orbitals for those two pi bonds. And then it must have then two sp hybrid orbitals for the sigma bond, right? So that's a situation for an sp hybridized carbon. Two p orbitals for two pi bonds here, and then two sp orbitals for two sigma bonds, okay? So one sigma bond is the carbon-carbon sigma bond, and the second sigma bond is a carbon hydrogen. The hydrogen is not shown here, but there is a hydrogen there. Okay. So I want to ask you in the in this context, what are the orbitals participating in this sigma bond? Okay. 
So that's a sigma sp sp3. Okay, so this carbon will be using a hybrid sp orbital, and this carbon will be using a hybrid sp3 hybrid orbital. So that's beautiful. Okay, so what is the hybridization of this oxygen here? What's the hybridization of that oxygen? So that oxygen has no double bonds. That oxygen is not next to any sp2 carbon. So therefore, that oxygen is sp3 hybridized. Guys, if sp3 has four sp3 hybrid orbitals, so what's the angle in between the two lone pairs of this oxygen? What's the angle in between the two lone pairs of the oxygen? It's sp3 hybridized. It has four sp3 hybrid orbitals, right? So one sp3 hybrid orbital for this sigma bond, one sp3 hybrid orbital for this sigma bond, the remaining two for the two lone pairs. What is the angle in between the two lone pairs? 109.5. If you're having troubles with this, do it step by step. So if you need to know what's the angle in between the two lone pairs, assign hybridization, sp3 hybridized. The moment you see this sp3 hybridized, you know that you will have four sp3 hybrid orbitals. And then go one at a time. One sp3 is gonna be used for a sigma bond, another sp3 for another sigma bond, and the remaining two for the two lone pairs. And I know that the angle in between every sp3 uh, uh, hybrid orbital will be 109.5. So if I'm asked what is the angle in between these two lone pairs, these two lone pairs will be 109.5 degrees from one another. What is the hybridization of these nitrogen guys? So that nitrogen will be sp3 hybridized. Once again, no pi bonds here. And next, everything is sp3. So that nitrogen will be sp3 hybridized, OK? So the lone pair of nitrogen in which kind of orbital will be located? Which orbital will we have the, the lone pairs of the nitrogen in? sp3 hybrid orbital. And the angle in between the lone pairs and the sigma bond will be 109.5. Correct? And finally, what is the hybridization of this nitrogen here? Okay. So that nitrogen is has lone pairs and it's next to an sp2 carbon so that nitrogen must be sp2 hybridized okay and now my question is is sp2 hybridized so the lone pair of the nitrogen in which orbital is located In which orbital is the lone pair of that nitrogen located? Perfect. In a pure p orbital. That's beautiful. And I'm going to repeat my analysis here. Okay. SP2 hybridized, it means that it has four orbitals surrounding. Three of them will be sp2, and the fourth will be a pure p orbital. I see that this nitrogen has three sigma bonds, one here and two with two nitrogens. So each sigma bond will be used for, it's for uh, through an sp2 hybrid orbital, three sp2 hybrid orbitals, three sigma bonds. So the four orbital, which is a pure p, will be for the lone pair. And the angle between the lone pairs and the three sigma bonds will be once again 
nine degrees. Okay, guys? That's very important. Any questions in regards to this? No questions? So I'm going to stop recording now.